So welcome everyone. Good afternoon. It's my privilege to welcome you to the first Kathy Cook Lecture in Women's Mental Health. I'm very, very pleased to see all of you here today, and I want to extend an especially warm welcome to all of you, and especially to Kathy's daughter, Abigail Stone, who joins us here today. This lecture is funded through an endowed fund for memorial gifts made to the hospital in memory of Kathy, who is the former Vice President and Chief Development Officer at McLean. It was Kathy's wish that any gifts in her honor be directed to support women's mental health at McLean. Kathy was a beloved member, as all of you know, of the McLean community for 17 years. She retire, retired in June 2016 and passed away on January 10th, 2017 after a battle with cancer. Kathy came to work at McLean in 1999 as the Director of Development. At that time, the department consisted of just two people, and Kathy was one of them. And during her time at McLean, she grew that department from 2 to 15, and through her really tireless work, extremely clear vision, and unyielding commitment to the hospital's mission, she transformed McLean's fundraising effort and increased our annual philanthropy by almost 400%. Kathy's perpetually, for those of you who, know, who knew her, her perpetually upbeat and warm personality, together with her absolute dedication to McLean's mission, enabled her to build trusting and long-lasting relationships with all of us here, faculty, staff, donors, potential donors, community members, and everybody who came in her path and was lucky enough to do so. During her tenure at the helm, the department raised more than $223 million for the hospital. Kathy's legacy at McLean is significant, and among her many accomplishments are things that I think we now all just think of as part of the fabric of the hospital, including the establishment of the McLean National Council, the creation of the McLean Board of Visitors, the growth of the department itself, and most recently, the launch and completion of the largest fundraising effort in the hospital's history, the campaign for McLean Hospital, which raised um, under her leadership $107 million in under five years, finishing early and over its original goal. Kathy's natural leadership abilities and her exuberance for her work, coupled with a true compassion for and interest in others and an uncompromising commitment to excellence, made her a wonderful mentor for everyone, including her new staff and, and um, new staff and also a tremendous colleague for all of us. Kathy showed early on a passion for the area of women's mental health and was one of the earliest supporters and champions of developing a division of women's mental health and also enabling an expansion of that vision. I am personally extremely grateful to Kathy. She was very supportive of me, both professionally and personally. I think of her very, very often. I miss her very much. This lecture is therefore particularly significant because it was really one of Kathy's last initiatives where she helped to launch something we call the Women's Mental Health Leadership Council. And that's a group that has grown now to comprise nearly 80 women in the community who are supportive of women's mental health treatment at McLean Hospital. Kathy had a steadfast commitment to growing support for women's mental health. She's deeply missed, but we are therefore even more thrilled to honor her with this lecture today. And so it is therefore really an extreme pleasure for me and also an honor to welcome Dr. Kimberly Yonkers back to McLean Hospital. Um, Dr. Yonkers and I go way back. We um, were residents together here at McLean Hospital, and um, it's delightful to have her. She's a very close colleague and a friend, and I'm very happy to welcome her back here to McLean. She is a graduate of Amherst College, Columbia, Physicians and Surgeons for Medical School, and as I said, McLean Hospital for her psychiatric residency training. Dr. Yonkers is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and also the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences and the School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the Yale School of Medicine. She's director of the Center of, for the Well-Being of Women and Mothers, director of research for the Yale New Haven Hospital Division in the Department of Psychiatry, and division director for the Psychological Medicine Service at Yale. She's conducted numerous uh, grant studies funded by the NIMH, NIDA, the National Institute on Child Health um, and Development, exploring optimal ways to in identify and engage and treat mood and substance use disorders in pregnant and postpartum women. 
She's also been a leader in codifying the diagnosis and the treatment of premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD. She's held numerous offices, including president of the North American Society for Psychosocial OBGYN. Um, she has been secretary of the International Association for Women's Mental Health and the Program Committee um, for Biological Psych Psychiatry. She was also on the DSM-5 task force for the American Psychiatric Association. She has um, multiple honors and other achievements. She's also an active clinician who's garnered many awards in the state of Connecticut and is an active mentor to undergraduate medical and postdoctoral students. And I am therefore really um, honored and pleased to welcome her here. She's going to talk with you about the course and consequences of anxiety disorders in pregnancy. So thank you. Thank, thank you so much. I just want, can people in the back hear me? Yeah, good, okay. It, it really is a pleasure to be here and to be the inaugural speaker. And I didn't know your mom. Uh, it, she sounds wonderful and I wish I, I did know her. It's just really an honor and kind of chokes me up to be back at McLean. I, I see familiar faces in the audience from just a few years ago. Wasn't it just a few years ago? So I was here as a resident with, with Shelly, and uh, I'm not going to give you the dates because we don't look that old, right? And I stayed on to do a fellowship, and actually during my fellowship years, when I started sort of going back and forth between the Brigham and McLean and seeing pregnant patients uh, at the Brigham and had a little clinic there and started to get my research going, uh, and then uh, was married, moved out to Texas for a few years, and then came back out east and have been at, at Yale since that time. Um, but I've had a chance to chat with a few people since I've been back. And uh, I, for those of you who are trainees at McLean, it's just such a treat. There really is no other institution, psychiatric institution like it. And I really consider it such a privilege to have been trained here, and I've seen other institutions. It's just really an amazing place, and it sounds like it's even better now than, than when I was there or here. And for the clinicians who are here and the teachers that I had, some of whom are in the audience, uh, I just want to thank you for what you gave me, and hopefully I've been able to pass that on to some of the people that I now mentor and train. But it's just a remarkable privilege to be here uh, and to have really benefited from everything that McLean had to offer to me and offers to many, many people, the patients that we treat, our trainees, our faculty, uh, the community. So it's just really wonderful. So um, yeah, I'm really, you can tell that I'm a little overcommitted because half of the slide includes titles and I actually have to do a fair amount of stuff where I am now at Yale. Uh, and what I'm going to be talking about today is really some of the work that I've done with regard to pregnancy and anxiety disorders. And um, I'm really going to not give you a broad overview of anxiety disorders in pregnancy, A, because there isn't that much really written in terms of the uh, volume of literature writ large. There are some studies, but I'm going to focus on some of the work that I've done, and particularly this large-scale study that we've used to um, explore a lot of associations and risk factors and uh, treatments. So I'm gonna be, and because my data, I have it, I can play with it, I can analyze it, and it, the, the data are really good. So I'm gonna really focus on some of my work. Uh, let me start with disclosures. This work was supported by a grant from, the, uh, from NIH, uh, the, the Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Uh, in terms of royalties I've, I've, or disclosures, I've received royalties from Up to Date, which is this encyclopedic uh, medical encyclopedia, basically, and that was for work for PMDD, not anything I'm discussing today, and I won't be discussing any off-label use of medication. So let me just begin by reminding you about the simple epidemiology of anxiety disorders. And this is really relevant, of course, for women's health, which is that uh, they are common in women. They're actually twice as common in women as men. 
And they, the difference between boys and girls starts, unlike depressive disorders, the gender difference starts around adolescence. For anxiety disorders, it starts uh, when, when people are really young, at least in terms of panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, and generalized anxiety disorder. And then the differences just increase over time. So for somebody like me, if I'm interested in women's health and I'm interested in pregnancy, there's an obvious intersection in that the pregnant women that I'm more likely to see who have a psychiatric illness are, are going to have some of these common disorders. As you see here, does this work or do I need to do this? Oh, there, it's there. It's subtle. It's very subtle. Uh, so here you see panic disorder, the 12-month prevalence, and then the lifetime prevalence is about 7%. Agoraphobia, I don't think people really believe these data, but uh, especially Europeans think it's much higher than that. Social anxiety disorder, again, quite common, generalized anxiety disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, one of the mysteries about post-traumatic stress disorder is that um, there is this difference, gender difference, in the risk of post-traumatic stress disorder, even though traumatic events presumably occur more often in men than women. I, I don't even know if I believe that nowadays with the Me Too movement. I think what we're really seeing are people um, disclosing events that maybe they didn't recognize early on or being triggered. It's really just a very interesting time. So I mentioned that anxiety disorders are more common in women and men. They have an onset in childhood, but they just continue to accrue over time. They may be somewhat more common in Native Americans and whites than other racial ethnic groups, although uh, things like social phobia and phobias in particular are more common in African Americans and whites. And they are more prevalent in lower socioeconomic uh, groups. So what I'm going to focus on in this particular presentation is uh, really what is the course and what are some of the birth outcomes uh, for offspring as well as women who have post-traumatic stress disorder in pregnancy, panic disorder in pregnancy, generalized anxiety disorder, and treatments for these conditions. And don't worry, I know that this is a standalone psychiatric hospital. I will operationalize things like birth outcomes uh, because you probably don't have a lot of talks on pregnancy at McLean. Maybe you do, because I know you have a very active well, uh, women's health program. So, um, OK, so we'll just start off. We know the treatments for anxiety disorders. And they, of course, include medication. And McLean is very, very strong on psychotherapy. I think still it certainly was very strong on psychotherapy when I was here. And so this, for therapy, it says, actually, I'm fine. I just like to have a place where I'm allowed on the couch. So our little friend there. Uh, it may be surprising. You know, We talk about the consequences of using a medication or taking a medication in pregnancy. Uh, but it is the case that over half of pregnant women take at least one prescription medication. And that doesn't include multivitamins. So the use of prescription medications in pregnancy is actually quite common. And so we need to really understand some of the consequences of both illnesses as well as taking medication in pregnancy. And here you see some data on medication use during pregnancy over time. And it's just been increasing over time. And these are now even a little bit this subtle pointer here. Um, it's actually been increasing over time. And it includes the first trimester as well as later times of pregnancy. Well, why is the first trimester important? Because the first trimester is the time where uh, babies are at risk of developing some malformation, some teratogenic effect from being on a medication. So we do try and avoid medications, particularly during the first trimester, if that's possible. It's not always possible, because sometimes people don't know they're pregnant, and they're well into the first trimester, and they figure out that the line is turning blue. Uh, and then some people just have illnesses that need to be treated over the course of pregnancy. Our field is really, uh-oh. Does that bring it back? Place a call. Our field is really one of the major, while he's trying to do that, I'll just talk. Um, our field is really one of the leaders in these data that you see. 
And because we tend to use, we tend to have patients who require chronic treatment. Whether we're talking about psychotic disorders or recurrent major depressive disorder or anxiety disorders, which tend to be very common. And in fact, if you talk to people who run teratogen information services, so teratogen information services are, or TISs, are some of these services where people can call if they're on a medication and they realize they're pregnant and they want to report it and they want to find out what are the consequences to my, to my baby, to my offspring, that I'm taking this medication during pregnancy. They will tell you that the patients who have mood and anxiety disorders are some of the most, well, not surprising, they're most anxious. They're the ones that are really soaking up a lot of the calls, a lot of the time, that are really worried about the consequences of, of what's happening. As well, we can now, um, we now hear from the media all the time. So, you know, I think my colleague Lee Cohen at, at the MGH has been quoted to saying, you know, anytime, or Zach Stowe from Atlanta, who used to be Atlanta, now he's in I don't know where he is. I think he's in Arkansas. Where, um, that any bad baby story just, you know, uh, receives tons and tons of information. So there's always a lot of attention to that. So we have to be very careful. You know, on the, on the one hand, we're trying to understand what's happening in pregnancy with psychiatric illness and with medication. But we're also trying to not alarm people, and we're trying to not stigmatize people. So. That's actually one of the reasons that I embarked upon this study, uh, which was a few years back. And at that time, we didn't know a lot about depression and its impact, possible impacts on uh, birth outcomes, maternal and fetal birth outcomes. And we didn't understand a lot about the consequences of antidepressant medication on these same outcomes. And there was this really, there was this debate that just by virtue of having a psychiatric illness in this particular case, having major depressive disorder meant that you were going to cause problems in your pregnancy, that you were more likely to deliver preterm or you were more likely to deliver a smaller baby. Uh, and I found that very problematic because of the lack of context as well as the lack of looking at the, the, the need for medication as well as what medications could be doing. And I thought that the message was kind of problematic that just because you had this illness that you didn't ask for and that you don't want, you may be causing some problems with your offspring. So a colleague of mine um, who, you know, I met her when I was taking a course during my K award at, in our School of Epidemiology at Yale, and her specialty was uh, perinatal epidemiology. And so then we got together and we wrote this big grant to specifically look at this issue kind of early on. Uh, and that is, is the Yale Pink and Blue study, which is listed here. And the point of this study was to investigate whether psychiatric disorder, in particular major depressive disorders, but also anxiety disorders, occurring in pregnancy increases the risk of preterm delivery or delivery of a low birth weight or small for gestational age baby. And some of the outcomes that we added, because everybody does this who works in perinatal epidemiology anyway, were things like cesarean delivery, hypertensive diseases of pregnancy, as well as ventilatory support. So we used, or in this particular talk, in some of the papers I've written, we used the data from Pink and Blue to explore anxiety disorders in pregnancy, uh, which is what I'm going to be talking about. The main point of the study was really um, mood disorders, but also anxiety disorders. So what's the longitudinal course of these conditions in pregnancy? Uh, because we had good longitudinal data. And what complications occurred to moms and their offspring uh, and who had anxiety disorders? And were they different for the different conditions? So, All right. Um, and then how did medication treatment factor into the pregnancy risk? So we didn't want to just look at the illness because treatment is a critical component of it. Uh, and for all we knew, treatment could actually enhance or improve outcomes. They could have worsened outcomes, we didn't know. OK, so let me talk to you a little bit about the methods. This was a prospective cohort study. We included, we recruited from 137 practices as well as hospital-based clinics, mostly throughout Connecticut, but also southern Massachusetts. A, a big partner for us was Bay State. Uh, we had to 
we had to have, receive approval from 12 human subjects boards. That was a lot of fun for anybody who has ever had to go through a human subjects board. And some of the human subjects boards were not as sophisticated as what you have at Harvard or Partners or McLean or Yale. And they had a lot of concerns about if we asked, for example, a pregnant woman if she was suicidal, was that going to like suggest to her that maybe she should try and attempt suicide? It was a very um, eye-opening experience. Uh, we required that our participants be enrolled before 16 weeks and six days of pregnancy. So we wanted a, a, a solid start date. We wanted to make sure that this truly was prospective. So it was before 17 weeks. We wanted to get people in sort of toward the end of the first trimester. Um, and uh, you know that, that required setting a, a particular time. We, we took the approach, an epidemiological approach, that these conditions, major depressive disorder, panic disorder, anxiety disorder, really the two critical conditions that we were recruiting for were major depressive disorder and PTSD. These were our exposures, if you will. Just like somebody might be you know, exposed, ex exposed to radiation. Our exposures were these target conditions, uh, as well as the treatment for those conditions. Uh, now, I know we live in the world, we live in the days of, of community participatory research, and so it, it's very interesting to note that for this particular project, as we were developing it, uh, our target condition really had been major depressive disorder. But we had partners who were very concerned about the birth outcomes among our women who had trauma, and particularly PTSD. Uh, and you know what they were telling us, and these were uh, nurse practitioners and our OBs, is they were seeing a lot of complications in this particular group. They were dissociating during delivery. They were having uh, a lot of problems. And that probably is not that surprising to people in this audience that, you know, if you've been, and since the trauma for women is typically sexual trauma, if you are pregnant and you have had sexual trauma, a trigger may be delivery or the whole pregnancy experience. So, so we added that actually as to an exposure be because we were recruiting for that as well. And then, of course, we wanted some unexposed comparators uh, as, to follow through the study. Um, we had some exclusions. They were really minimal. They had to be at least uh, 17 years of age. They couldn't be planning to terminate their pregnancy because we were looking at pregnancy outcomes, and that would not be helpful to us. We, had to, we only included people that spoke English or Spanish. We did offer the um, interviews in Spanish. At that time, they had to have a telephone. And when we did this work, it was not that long ago, but Cell phones were not ubiquitous at that time. Uh, so that was, you know, people were still relying on landlines. We did try and recruit people who planned to stay in the area because we wanted to follow them prospectively, and then we wanted to be able to collect their birth outcome data. We did not include people who at the outset had insulin-dependent diabetes because that's actually a risk factor for preterm delivery as well as low birth weight as well as uh, large babies. And then we did not recruit people with a known multifetal gestation. Uh, you know, of course, we did have people with gestational diabetes, and we did have a few people who later on found out that they were having twins. Uh, they, we didn't have triplets. They usually know right away. <laughs> so <laughs> this was the design of our study. So the initial interview that was done early uh, occurred between 6 and 16 weeks. And uh, it was a face-to-face -face interview. We went out to people's homes. We administered the CD, really the Lifetime Depression and, and Anxiety Disorder modules for the CD. Uh, the MD, we collected all the symptoms on major depressive disorder and other symptoms prior to pregnancy as well. Uh, and then we collected information monthly. So we tried to get an intellectual, a, a, a prospective snapshot. We also collected information about any medication that they were taking. So it says antidepressants here, uh, but it was any medication. What we did is we actually asked them to bring their bottles in, and we just wrote down what their prescription bottles did, had on them. Uh, then we conducted a monitoring interview at between 28 and 32 weeks. That was conducted over the telephone. And then postnatally, we re-interviewed them about one to three months after they delivered. 
uh, and we did a medical record review to extract their birth outcomes. And what we did when we were extracting their birth outcomes is we did it in a, in a more obstetrical way. We didn't just look at a diagnosis of preterm delivery. We actually looked at all of the elements, you know, when they started having, you know, whether they had PPROM, which is premature rupture of membranes, and whether, you know, how, how long they were in labor, and the contractions, and all this level of detail. That's a lot for psychiatry, I have to say. Especially, I trained here. I did train it in general hospital. Uh, I feel like I had to pull back a lot of information from medical school and work a lot with my obstetrical colleagues. So um, this is just our cohort. Uh, we had a little over 9,500 volunteers who were interested in participating in the study. Uh, there were some who were either not eligible or subsequently refused. And then we had a group here were, who were eligible and screened uh, negative for the study. And what we did is we, because we had more people who were not exposed than people who were exposed, we randomly selected one third of the individuals who were not exposed. And so it didn't mean that they actually could have had panic disorder or they could have had GAD. Uh, but they did not have one of our target exposures, which was MDD, antidepressant treatment, or PTSD. Um, and then the people who were randomly selected were invited to participate, and then anybody who had one of our exposures was invited to participate. And we ended up um, inviting 3,517 women. Uh, we had a small group that declined, and we interviewed 2,793 women. Uh, you know, because of the timing, some people just made it over that mark where before we could get out to see them, they were 17 weeks or 17 weeks in one day, and we weren't able to include them. So it wasn't just that they didn't, they decided not to participate. It was, a lot of it was, was the timing and the mechanism of this. And then we had 2,654 uh, singleton live births, and most of the data are based upon, that I have are based upon singleton live births. So this is just a little bit of information about our particular cohort. Uh, as you might imagine, so our recruitment area was, was really, we had a couple of inner city areas like New Haven and Hartford and Springfield, uh, but that we had a lot of women coming in from uh, the suburbs, uh, which resulted in a cohort um, that was predominantly white, although there was a not insubstantial you know, percentage of people who were, were uh, racial or ethnic minorities. And not surprisingly, this is a young cohort, although we had a, we had a pretty substantial 35 plus group. And that probably reflects just the level of education, you know, that it, overall in this particular cohort. Um, and you can see that over in the bottom right hand corner. I'm not going to rely on this here. So, you know, we had 56.6% of people who had 16 years or greater of education. So it was, that actually, this actually makes our cohort somewhat unique, both in comparison to a cohort that I had collected from Healthy Start prior to this, which was uh, largely inner city minority women. Uh, and a lot of the birth data, registry data that we see from the United States, which is largely um, inner city minority women. Um, based upon the researchers who've done the work. Um, so our, our cohort is also pretty unique with regard to that. Most of our participants were married or cohabitating, and um, we had a healthy number or percentage of women who were in their first pregnancy, so uh, reflected here. So one of the things I think is really interesting, and it bears upon you know, what I was talking before, which is what happens with medication treatment of pregnancy, was um, the spontaneous discontinuation of pregnancy. And I think Dr. Dossarini and I were just chatting briefly about that before, that uh, a lot of times people are taking medication, the line turns blue, and they stop taking their medication. Um, this is a little, uh, we actually did a deep dive into this and looked at week by week um, medication use, because we had a question of when you stopped your medication, and then we collected you know, detailed data about medication use. And this is a little bit of a cartoon. It was really much more here, I think, that it, it really decreased. Um, but um, it is the case that 
people, you know, a lot of people stop their antidepressant use in pregnancy, and then they increased it uh, at, as soon as they delivered. Now, we didn't find that rates of major depressive disorder increased during the postpartum period, which is very interesting. Uh, and we looked at this every way possible. We looked at multiple measures. We looked at symptoms. We looked at, so I don't know what these people were doing here. Uh, but we didn't see illnesses increase during the postpartum period. And we're not the first ones to, to actually see that, uh, that in a lot of cases, the risk of depression doesn't increase in the postpartum period. But the increase, there was an increase in medication. Whether people actually started to sense that they may be relapsing and went ahead and restarted their medication, or were fearful that they might, might relapse based upon previous experience, um, I can't say, but we certainly did see that. It didn't, it didn't go, the rate of antidepressant use didn't go up to where it was uh, before people participated, but it certainly did increase a bit. So I want to talk about the course of illness in pregnancy and whether symptoms approved, improved across pregnancy, really how long did they endure, and what the natural course of illness is, because this can really help clinicians strategize with their patients how best to manage their condition. Uh, so, you know, for example, for manic depressive illness, when people discontinue their medication in pregnancy, they relapse. There's not a lot of benefit if you're pregnant um, to, um, let me rephrase that. You don't get a lot of therapeutic benefit by virtue of being pregnant if you have manic depressive illness. There may be some mild benefit, but if you stop your medication, you're generally going to relapse. Uh, and so, and the, the issue with major depressive disorder is a little complex. Uh, for those of you who know a, a really a, a classic paper that was published in JAMA by, by Lee Cohen and Zach Stowe, they found a very, very high rate of relapse for recurrent major depressive disorder if people discontinued medication. Their hazard ratio was something like five, so it was really profound. We looked at that in our data, and we just, we didn't see that. Uh, we saw a very small increment. It wasn't even statistically significant. And it may be that our cohort, our, our women, were recruited not from somebody's, you know, tertiary treatment center coming in for consultation, we were, com we were really recruiting your typical woman who comes in to their OB-GYN's office because they're pregnant and they're on antidepressants or they're, they're ha they have a history of depression. So we probably had a less severe end of the spectrum, which I think actually fills in some of the gaps, right? Um, because if you're out there and you're treating a patient and she gets pregnant, uh, you want to know the full end of the spectrum about whether somebody should you know, continue medication in pregnancy or discontinue medication in pregnancy. And it's not a trivial issue because the baseline rate for malformations is about 5%. And so, you know, even if you have a, if you're perfect, you don't take a Tylenol, you don't drink a cup of coffee, you don't have a sip of wine when you're pregnant, you know, there's still 5% of people who are going to have some complications. And we're treating the most anxious and the most depressed group who have a propensity already to blame themselves for anything that happened during their pregnancy. So, you know, we really want, we want to know what happens just in a very healthy population so we can put that into context. Because so often, what I, and what I tell my patients uh, or the people I consult to is a lot of this is true, true, not related. It may have nothing to do with the fact that you did this, or dis did this, or, or did that. And I think it's really helpful for our patients to know and be educated about what some of the risks are, what are the, some, some of the risks are not. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about um, panic disorder, but I do want to preface that, and we may have less appreciation for it. You know, our, we as mental health professionals may have less appreciation for it than our colleagues who are OB-GYNs or cardiologists, but one of the things that you really don't want to see if you're working in a general medical hospital or in, in ED is you don't want a pregnant woman coming in saying that she has chest pain and she can't breathe because she's pregnant. And we think, oh, maybe it's a panic attack, but other docs think 
PE, somebody could have a pulmonary embolus, or they could have a fib, or they could have, be having a heart attack or something like that. And it's terrible when it happens to anybody. It's really terrible when it happens to a young woman, and it's really terrible when it happens to a pregnant young woman. So um, you know, having information on panic disorder and pregnancy can, can really help our colleagues in other fields as well. These are the symptoms. Um, and one of the things I wanted to put up here to just as a reminder, you know, we think about panic disorder, people having panic attacks. But part of the disorder is also one month of persistent concern of recurrence or impairment. So you could, in fact, have um, not have any panic attacks during pregnancy and still have that concern or that fear about having a subsequent panic attack. And that will still leave you in episode of, of illness. Um, and, and as a codicil, I will say that one of the things that these data are able to do is we can look at registry data. For example, you know, the Swedish have a very, very rich registry data. You know, if you're Swedish, you get assigned a number, and it follows you. And, you know, if you see your ob that's your number. If you see a psychiatrist, that's your number. If you see your family practitioner. And they can link these databases, and they can come up with some really important information. And they can do some interviews at baseline of pregnancy and then afterward. But what they can't do is they can't, they can't really diagnose panic disorder the way that we can with our instruments and with our level of expertise because of some of these nuances. Like, you could still be an episode for panic disorder even if you're not having panic attacks. So, uh, These are the characteristics of our cohort. Uh, we actually had a lot of women who had panic attacks in pregnancy, the 237 before pregnancy, and then 183 continued to have uh, panic attacks uh, in pregnancy. Panic disorder was less, but still, um, still probably the world's largest longitudinal cohort of people with panic attacks. Uh, disorder in pregnancy. Now, panic disorder, you know, we had some hypotheses about what would happen with anxiety disorders in general and panic disorder in particular. And so this is just sort of a reminder of, you know, what happens hormonally during pregnancy. Uh, and not surprisingly, and this, this just focuses on progesterone and its metabolites, but, you know, as pregnancy progresses, you get these really massive levels of progesterone um, compared to the non-gravid state. And one of the things that's also interesting about progesterone is progesterone is metabolized to 5-alpha-dihydroprogesterone, or 5-dihydro-P, five, five, five and then further met metabolized through a reduction of the A-ring of the compound to allopregnanolone. And some of you may know that this is actually a GABA agonist. And some agonists of aloe have been used as anesthetics. So one could hypothesize that as pregnancy progresses, that you are actually making more of a natural um, hormone that could, be, that could have anxiolytic properties. And if you've been pregnant, as I have, and may, maybe other people in the audience have been, you may have noticed that you slow down a little bit. And maybe you react a little bit less. And maybe you're a little, you know, I felt like I was a little slower when I was pregnant. So, it, and it may be that this is part of natural selection. You know, we, want, we don't want pregnant women running around like doing too much and, you know, putting themselves and their fetus at risk. We want them to be a little bit more chill and nest and things like that. And it could be that this would be potentially beneficial um, over the course of pregnancy. But then there are other things that are also happening simultaneously. And we know, for example, that people who have panic disorder are very sensitive to interoceptive cues, right? So a couple skipped heartbeats, oh my god, you know, they don't even notice it, but they feel like they're having a panic attack and that it sort of snowballs. Or maybe some, you know, uh, something that triggers shortness of breath for whatever reason, and that could trigger a panic attack even without them knowing it. And there are paradigms for this. You know, we put people in chairs, and we spin them around, and we give them, you know, CO2 masks, and we can precipitate panic attacks. Um, so, you know, in pregnancy, there's an increase in uterine contents, which actually can constrict, you know, the stroke volume for, or, or the ventilatory volume, and that could potentially actually be a trigger instead of, uh, 
you know, a benefit in panic. So we in in a pregnancy. So we didn't really know what would happen across the course of of pregnancy for panic disorder. And this just is a side a slide to to show you about um, some of these. They're called neurosteroids. They're really hot now. You've probably been visited by some. Sage representative because they have an analog of allopregnanolone that they want to use to treat um, postnatal women with, with depression. Um, so we're going to be seeing these first in class drugs. Um, but this is really the part of the you know, biological um, hypothesis that's related to this, which is progesterone is metabolized and to 5-alpha di dihydropy and then allopregnanolone. And this has non-genomic properties. Um, at, at the GABA-R receptor, kind of like barbiturates, but there are also some genetic effects as a result of these compounds. So this is what we found in terms of the course of illness for panic. Um, and I would just bring your attention to this line. We did find that 10% of our women actually continue to be an episode during pregnancy. But we did have this like smattering of people who were symptomatic in the first trimester and then offset. Some people developed symptoms again. Um, but And then some people just had them toward the end of pregnancy. So it was really kind of all over the place. Um, but a little bit um, somewhat consistent. We looked at the symptoms that people were experiencing a couple at different times in pregnancy and just reflect back on, on that slide I showed you. So you know we would see these large increases in progesterone and some of these natural anxiolytics, if you will. And I had wondered whether um, some of the symptoms may change. And we did see, uh, actually, a decrease in shortness of breath um, as for panic symptoms. So people were complaining less about that um, during the second trimester, or third trimester, compared to the first trimester. Uh, so there did seem to be some possible anxiolytic properties, but it wasn't really profound. We weren't really seeing a lot. Um, of offset. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the treatment. This says each capsule contains your medication plus a treatment for each of its side effects. So this is the, these are the course data I showed you. We had low treatment rates. And this just goes to show OBGYNs don't like using benzodiazepines. There aren't a lot of data on the other than malformations of the effects of benzodiazepines on pregnancy, but they don't like to use them. Um, and then we had SRI data. So about 20% of our women were using SRIs, and it may remain pretty stable across, across pregnancy. This is just a fi more fine-grained look at panic attacks across pregnancy. And so I think one of the stories here is you, this is six months before, zero to six months, and this is in pregnancy. And this gray bar is no panic attacks. So you did see some potential anxiolytic property as pregnancy uh, went forward and that more people became panic-free. But then there were some people that were pretty refractory, and maybe even this bumped up a little bit uh, at least once a week. So there was a little bit of movement. But the overall, I think, picture is, is less frequent panic attacks, even though we had a fair number of people who were just remaining in disorder. So let me move on and talk about what we saw with generalized anxiety disorder across pregnancy. Everybody knows the symptoms. One thing I will say is that because our, our time frame was short, we didn't look at a six-month duration of GAD. We just looked at one-month um, dur duration of GAD. In my view, I, you know, I don't see the rationale for why DSM-5 should have six months anyway. I mean, we really have you know, the, that and dysthymic disorder, like really, for two years. I mean, we don't have longitudinal data that really supports you know, that somebody is really symptomatic. And I suspect that, and this is what we found with HARP, for the Harvard Anxiety Research Project, that people were kind of going in and out of episodes anyway. Um, but, you know, I didn't have that profound a role in DSM-5 anyway. So this is what we found for GAD in pregnancy. Um, really low rates, even with the one month, let alone the six month, only six people. Uh, and we had a lot of people who had generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, more people had generalized anxiety disorder, but more people seem to offset in pregnancy. And whether that's, you know, I, I would say that pregnancy is a pretty good treatment for GAD. So if you're treating somebody for GAD and they want to know whether they should continue their medication and 
Maybe they shouldn't because this is a pretty good treatment. Maybe it's as good as SRIs. I don't know. Um, so a few people were undergoing benzodiazepine treatment, a few people SRIs, a little bit less than panic, um, but still they tended to get well. Um, we also looked at PTSD. Uh, again, you know the symptoms associated with PTSD. This was DSM-4 PTSD, not DSM-5 PTSD. Um, and uh, you can just move on to this. This is what we saw for the course of PTSD in pregnancy. And this was really kind of remarkable. We had one person who remained in episode during their entire pregnancy. And you see this kind of 47% uh, of our cohort actually remitted during this first trimester. And then you add, you know, these nine people, this additional 7%, over half of our people uh, with PTSD remitted initially and then relapsed. And their medication treatment was not actually changing all that much across pregnancy, uh, which is here, low treatment rates. Now, these were probably not you know, the most symptomatic people with PTSD, but they really did have PTSD. It's not very easy to meet the CD criteria for it. Um, and uh, yeah, and so we, we think pregnancy is a pretty good treatment for PTSD. So um, pretty remarkable difference. So in summary, we, we found that GAD and PTSD were more prevalent in the first trimester, really had a high rate of offset by the second and third trimester. Um, although there were 30% of women who had an onset later in pregnancy. And it may be, like I said before, for some people that could really be a trigger. Uh, very few women had symptoms across pregnancy. Uh, panic disorder was the most chronic. And I'll just mention, I, I'm not showing the data today, but we found similarly with major depressive disorder, it was the magically disappearing diagnosis when you follow it truly prospectively across pregnancy. It was quite remarkable. And people didn't seem to have uh, a lot of relapse. So let me turn to talk about some of the maternal and neonatal outcomes and just sort of remind you about, if in epidemiological terms, this is how we operationalize a lot of these outcomes. Preterm birth are those births that occur before 37 completed weeks of pregnancy. So that's 36 weeks plus six days. Low birth weight is less than 2,500 grams. We looked at cesarean delivery. We looked at hypertension of pregnancy, which includes preeclampsia and help, which is very uncommon, um, as well as gestational hypertension. Uh, we also looked at the need for minor ventilatory intervention, which would have been you know, this daily suctioning and a little bit of nasal O2, as well as more um, uh, invasive ventilatory support like CPAP or just needing to be ventilated. So um, we had previously published a paper using a Healthy Start cohort where we found actually that PTSD was associated with preterm birth. And we thought we would find it in the second large cohort, which we didn't. Um, and it may be because uh, the air in the room was really being soaked up by those people who had complex PTSD, who had both PTSD and MDD. And I still wonder when I read some of the papers in the literature that associate the diagnosis of MDD with some adverse birth outcomes, if they're really not picking up this really ill group who's more likely, you know, if you have a person who has both PTSD and MDD and you're a family practitioner or a primary care doctor or an OB-GYN, right, you're more likely to diagnose MDD, um, the A than PTSD, and you're more like, because you know more about it, it's more common. Uh, and you're more likely to diagnose MDD um, and P in somebody who has both PTSD and MDD because they're gonna, they're gonna, you're gonna pick them up more easily. They have, you know, you're gonna, they're gonna take your attention. So I, I really do think that that may be responsible for some of the findings in the literature. But we certainly um, don't replicate the findings in the literature in a very carefully, you know, characterized cohort that. MDD was associated with preterm birth, per se. We do see a small effect for SSRIs, which has been reported by us as well as in the literature um, previously. Um, and cigarette use actually um, is not 
so highly associated with preterm birth. It is highly associated with small for gestational age outcomes. So this is really just what I was saying in terms of some of our birth outcomes. Um, so first, we took a look at the disorders. And again, sort of along the lines of, you know, if, if you do have a, a condition, and we had a lot of people who didn't, who just had the condition and no treatment, uh, you saw our treatment rates. Was there any particular effect on a variety of birth outcomes, um, including the hypertensive diseases, C-sections, preterm birth, low birth weight, ventilatory support, just by virtue of having an illness? And we really didn't see much. Um, we had some findings with pretty substantial odds ratios, um, like panic disorder and ventilatory support, which maybe um, this could be type 2 error. It could be, you see the confidence interval is very wide, and it could be that we just did not have enough people. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if there was some genetic component to this, you know, to panic disorder and ventilatory support in, in babies. We just didn't see it in this particular cohort, but it was a small number. Uh, then we looked at the flip side of that, which are some of the treatments, uh, and that's really where a lot of the action was. Um, so we found that use of an SRI in pregnancy increased the risk of developing hypertensive disease in pregnancy almost threefold. Other groups have reported specifically on preeclampsia in relation to depression or SRI use. We found this in our in relation to SRI use across the board. Caesarean delivery was more common with benzodiazepine use, and this is really an issue in the OB field because we're trying to clamp down on the number of caesarean deliveries, especially because once you've had one caesarean delivery, most people will, you know, if you have another child, you'll have another caesarean delivery. And it really, it didn't, it makes a lot of sense to me because I think it may be contributing to some atonia in terms of the uterus, but what didn't make sense is we saw this even for people who use benzos early, early in pregnancy, too. So that means it may have something to do with placentation, which is you know, how the, the conceptus um, develops its system in the uterus and, and you know, the whole system that can then lead to problems like preeclampsia and, and preterm birth. Uh, we did see low birth weight, but um, they were appropriate for age given the high rate of preterm delivery. Neonatal ventilatory support, again, this sort of makes sense that it would be more common in the setting of benzodiazepine use. And, you know, when you look at these data, it really does suggest that for moms who have anxiety disorders in pregnancy, if you can avoid taking benzodiazepines, particularly toward the end of pregnancy, that's a really good idea. And it's not just from the malformation perspective. It's really also from, from the birth outcome perspective. Uh, SRI use in pregnancy has been associated with preterm birth by our group as well as other groups. It really shortens it between a couple and five days. So it gets you into that box of preterm delivery, which is an epidemiological construct. And you know, we know that the complications are higher in, in kids that are born preterm. But the actual continuous measure of how early it is um, doesn't worry me very much. But, Maybe mediated, we don't see that it's mediated by depression or anxiety disorders, but maybe other substance use, things that we didn't pick up. I should say that in these analyses, we also controlled for illicit substances, illicit substances such as alcohol and smoking. We controlled for weight. We controlled for um, a whole variety of factors. So th this was, because we had a really rich database, we could really isolate some of the effects. Effects on placentation, effects on fetal membranes. And actually, we have a laboratory model that one of my colleagues and collaborators has been working on. And we've been looking at apoptosis in fetal membranes um, as a result of antidepressants and some downstream um, increase in, in, in immune modulators that are associated with antidepressant use in pregnancy. This association that we found with hypertensive diseases in pregnancy and SRI, uh, it's, it's also been shown by other groups, but the data are really mixed. And what's this due to? We know SRIs are so, or blockage of serotonin uh, can lead to vasoconstriction. Maybe it's inhibition of, 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 of nitric oxide, which would cause vasodilation. We don't know. Um, other mediators are possible. 
Uh, the low birth weight finding that we had, um, the babies were actually preterm more than low birth weight, so they were small because they were preterm, not small because they were small. So they were appropriately sized for um, the duration of, of uh, pregnancy. I already spoke a little bit about benzodiazepine and neonatal support. It sort of makes sense when we think about what happens with adults uh, and benzodiazepine use. So it, they, of course, they can impair ventilatory drive in adults, if, especially at high doses. So it makes sense that that could happen with, with babies. And depending on what the compound is and what the dose was, we're not talking about a two compartment. You know, this, we're talking about much larger um, uh, number of compartments here because the baby's in the uterus and amniotic fluid, and then it gets into baby's brain. So you know, it, it's it's pretty complex. It's also possible that some of this was a withdrawal from benzodiazepines, and people have hypothesized that, um, or we could have missed other concurrent substance use in this. This. This was pretty minor. I would not particularly be worried about this. This was in association with SRI use. But a lot of babies end up being put in special care briefly because of these mild respiratory problems that they develop when their mom has taken an SRI um, putatively, mechanistically associated. So anyway. So in summary, these data don't support a strong association between maternal anxiety disorders and adverse maternal and fetal outcomes. And I, you know, this, this paper, because it was a pregnancy paper and it involved psychiatric illness, of course, you know, we were interviewed by NPR and of course it was picked up by the media. And, you know, when we do this, we really work on the messaging of how this is going to come through. And this was really what I pitched for the take home message that this is really a good news story, right? Because it means that we don't need to blame our patients <laughs> for having a psychiatric illness that they don't want. It's not their fault if they have some of these complications. And it really isn't their fault if they need to take medication either. Uh, in point of fact, a lot of the outcomes that we saw were pretty infrequent uh, and pretty minor, the preterm birth being the quintessential example. The ventilatory support, I think, was a little bit with benzodiazepines was a little bit problematic. Uh, and I think it really should inform us in terms of our treatment and what we need to tell our patients if they absolutely have to take Clonopin or Ativan or whatever um, to control their panic attacks that their baby will have to be monitored and there is the potential for this um, potential uh, complication. I think some of the findings really do warrant some exploration. Like it would be nice to know even though, you know, it's a few days, why are, and, and I should say that the difference, preterm birth can occur spontaneously or it could be because we just decide it's time to deliver. The spontaneous preterm birth rate we saw was much higher. It was much more profound than the overall preterm birth rate. And it really does suggest some biological mechanism is at hand, either um, you know, very close to delivery, such as apoptosis, um, or later on. And apoptosis is really interesting, too, because early in pregnancy, that's been one of the putative mechanisms that people have invoked for the effects of alcohol on the fetus is inappropriate apoptosis. Uh, and so we need to be thoughtful about that and what that could be doing biologically um, in utero. So, um, so with that, um, I want to thank you for everything I had to say. And this, these are members of my team that helped in this work. Um, there were a lot of us. And my collaborator, um, who really helped to have this work done, and I know She's looking down and seeing this. So thank you very much. I shouldn't have spoken so much. You could just speak loudly. <laughs> thank you. That was a, a, a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, my question is the following. Uh, I know that there are some preclinical models looking at the effect of SSRI on, uh, these are you know, rodents studies, looking at the effect of SSRI on depressive phenotypes later. In, yeah. So are you aware of any uh, similar um, 
data in humans, and maybe even in your own study, at the potential effect of uh, SSRI use during pregnancy on the child, yeah. emergence of depressive phenotypes yeah. later, later in life. So because they, you know, obviously exposure to SSRI might lead to right. uh, changes uh, in, in receptor density, potentially also in, right, in the offspring. Right, right, right. So, so the question is, is there a possible impact of SRI on emotional symptoms in kids? That, ex that is an exposure. And there has been a very, very small literature. There's a paper on gene by environment interaction. So, you know, kids with a certain gene who are exposed to SRIs in pregnancy may have a proclivity to anxiety disorders or mood disorders. Um, you know, there's also a literature showing that um, kids that were exposed to SRIs in pregnancy don't have differences in cognitive function, you know, that they actually do pretty well. So I think that this is going to be the, the epi genetics of this is going to be very interesting to see if there are some longer term consequences uh, to kids that were exposed to SRIs in utero, as well as benzodiazepines. Yeah, Ross. Did, did I get the story right that there's a slight uptick in the first trimester of most of these anxiety disorders? That if you compare pre-pregnant first trimester, there's a modest up, uptick? Um, not really compared to six months. Compared to six months before, everything actually kind of goes down. Um, you're talking about, let me, you, were you talking about the slide with all the bars? I, I thought in some of the day, you had a bar graph where, oh. in panic at least, it yeah. looked as if there was a little increase. Let me just But only in, the only in the first trimester. Yeah, there, there certainly, here, this is the slide. I'm not making it big here because I can't see the thing. Oh, here it is. All right. Um, Takes a little time before this goes out. So, so what we do the six month before. There, there it is. Oh, you got it. Okay, the six month period before is generally. Um, this is six I mean, months. If you look before. at so, yeah, the, there's. The there is a little the, bit of the red less and likely the green to be bars panic are going up. Yeah, yeah. Could I, could I ask the question that's behind the question? Of course. Did you look to see if there's a bias toward that risk in first trimester with people who are coming off medication? Um, which is we haven't old, specifically which is looked old, at that. It, it may be the case. It's pretty. It's a pretty small effect. Yeah. Um, it kind of stays, I mean, it, when you look, it, and it depends on the severity category, these are such small numbers when we start to look at this, yeah. you know, this is that least once per day group. Um, it's really hard to statistically okay. find. I mean, I think qualitatively you could look and say that something might be happening, but our numbers are really too small, and the treatment numbers were really small. I, I was hoping the answer was no, because the rest of the... Uh, Take home is very positive and reassuring. Okay, well, for you then, no. 